Okay, let's see. Um, all right, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, Mike Grossell here with Engineers for Communities live show. We've got a really special guest today, Giovanni Romero. He's the district manager at Morrison Creek Water and Sanitation District in Route County, Colorado. Gio, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Mike. To so I, I wanted to start off by just kind of asking about your your work history. I think it's quite interesting how you got to where you were. Uh, how do, how do you become a district? What's the path to becoming a district manager? Oh, Mike, I think the path to becoming a district manager of a water or sanitation district uh, is, is a lot of work. A lot of work and in, in, in being uh, involved with the community. Um, and more than anything, I think wanting to be part of the community, serve your community um, in everywhere you go. Um, I, I started my career, uh, you know, I, I, I am a U.S. immigrant. I, I moved to the United States when I was 17 years old by myself. Um, I went to school, went to college. Um, I had to work and pay my way through college. Um, and uh, after a few years, uh, you know, I was just kind of trying to work and go to school and work and try to school and try to pay for my, my studies. Um, you know, I finally, after a few years of being in the U.S., uh, became a, a U.S. legal resident, and I was able to join the military at that point. And, um, you know, that was 20, 20 plus years ago. Um, and I joined the Corps of Engineers. Um, you know, I, I worked as a, as a combat engineer for many, many years. And um, after, um, mm. you know, I... I I was able to learn a lot on the job. I, uh, I started to go to school again through the military. And um, after many years of hard work, being deployed overseas several times, you know, I got a lot of knowledge. I, I obtained a lot of knowledge. I gained a lot of knowledge from uh, just on hands uh, doing the work, very, very manual labor. And uh, you know, finally, uh, you know, putting a lot of time into my school. And even when I was deployed, I tried to at least try to take one class or something if I was able to do it remotely. Um, and, uh, you know, we did a lot of small city infrastructure, uh, a lot of uh, sanitation work, uh, fortification of U.S. bases, um, so, you know, the, the, the knowledge was very broad. Um, you know, we'd worked a lot of defensive positions, uh, for American bases overseas. Um, you know, but the, one of the most important things in every base, you know, so everybody stays healthy was sanitation. Um, you know, water sanitation was always key part, a key part of any, uh, improvements to any U.S. or uh, allies um, for uh, needs for a base. So, anyways, after that part of my military career in the Corps of Engineers, um, I went back. I, I, I got out of active duty, went back to school. I always stayed in the in the reserve, um, still to the day, um, and. Uh, Decided to go back to school and, uh, you know, they did uh, some chemical uh, engineering, then some civilian work. And uh, I ended up moving up to meeting my, my wife, my now wife, and she lived in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And, you know, I was trying to debate, you know, should I stay in Denver? Should I go to Steamboat? And obviously, you know, I decided to go up to the mountains. and It's, it's you know, not a bad spot to be. <laughs> Uh, steamboat is i think steamboat's like this hidden gem well it's not it's becoming less hidden um, it's becoming so less hidden for appeal. sure the appeal is yeah. amazing and uh so i ended up in steamboat and you know I, I started working on the chemical lab and that was all great and then finally um you know i, I was able to uh, get a job at the county and the road and bridge um shop 
and uh, that was that's kind of where I started my actual career, I would say, as a, as a as an engineer, as a uh, as a project manager, um, you know, running some larger construction projects, um, and uh, and it was great. I loved every minute of it. Um, I loved the people that I worked with. I re- had a really good mentor. Um, we had we had a really good engineer. Her name was Janet Ruby, who was just on point, and she was just you know allow your mind to flow free and try you know just kind of let you roll with your with your within your job description. Uh, but you know we had a lot of freedom to create and um, and and just basically create our own. Uh, scope of what, how we wanted to see our county grow, our city grow, and, you know, having had the experience of being, you know, having grown up in Ecuador and having lived overseas and having gotten the opportunity to work in the military, you know, I got to see a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different types of engineering and a lot of different types of work and a lot of different types of work processes that, uh, um, you know, gave me a little bit of, a, I, I believe, a, an advantage on, on between some other candidates because I was, I, I think, I could see a little bit broader. Um, yeah. You know, like, um, you know, I think that growing up in a third world country, you gain a lot of things of how you not want, <laughs> how should how things should shouldn't be, uh, and uh, and I think that's uh, that's that's a really good experience to have. Um, so I worked at uh, Red County Road and Bridge, and uh, we we you know uh, we had a small team, um, and you know we we had a lot of work, and, and you know just building roads, rebuilding roads, um, you know with snow plowing schedules because you know as as you know we have a lot of snow, Steamboat and Red County we get you know uh, quite a bit of snow, so uh, snow plowing is kind of its own thing, um, and snow maintenance. Um, uh, you know, uh, r- road resurfacing, striping, r- road signage. I mean, it just all encompassing road work, which was a fantastic experience to have. Um, I got to meet a lot of really good people, uh, really good workers, really good on on gr- in the ground. Uh, you know, field crews, um, as well as the planners, which I think that's where you know where we. Kind of our scope is in the planning, staging, designing, and then execution uh, of uh, projects. During that time in in my career, I met a very interesting person, uh, Steve Colby. Um, he was the previous general manager of the Morrison Creek Water and Sanitation District, and. Uh, you know, I had met him, you know, just kind of through some road work and they, they were working on some utilities and whatnot. And one day he told me he was retiring. He had been running the, the district for 35 years. And, uh, <laughs> you wow. know, he had the district was under bankruptcy. I'll go into the, all, more details on this later, but the district was under bankruptcy for many years. So. You know, he led the district through bankruptcy and whatnot. So he had a really tough time just keeping it together. Uh, you know, there was no improvements, no nothing. You know, his focus was to whatever they had, just keep it together until the district came out of bankruptcy. And then at that point, you know, the district would have to be assessing how their finances were to, to see if any improvements were even possible at that time. So Steve Colby came up, you know, we, we were talking and he told me, you know, I'm about to retire and, I, and the district has been looking for a candidate to take over for me. And we have gone through several rounds and we just can't find somebody to, to do it. And I, I wasn't even aware of this yet. Apparently it had been listed for months and they had the district board had held many interviews. It's just, you know. Being that we are so remote, uh, the cost of living and many other aspects, you know, it was just hard to find somebody to to take over. Anyway, so I interviewed and, uh, you know, I obviously got the job. 
and it was the beginning of a new era for me and also for the district. As I got hired on, the very first thing they told me is we need a new wastewater treatment plant. And we have been working with a firm to do the design. And now we just need to be able to build it. And I remember in my first interview, I, I said, um, I can build anything, really. <laughs> but, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but how do I pay for it? I remember clearly saying, how do I pay for it? And it's being that the district had no finances to, to, to commit something like this, and to, to uh, a revival of the, the district and, you know, massive expenditures right off the bat. Anyway, so then I was welcome to the world of writing grants and trying to find financing through the state and the federal government um, and just kind of navigating that world, which, you know, I wasn't too unfamiliar with, but this was brought me to another level of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, wind me back a little bit here. So what Mor Morrison Creek water and sanitation, it was in bankruptcy when you get there. How, like, how was it formed? Like, kind of, give me a brief overview. Like, how did it come to be? Okay, so the Morrison Creek Water Sanitation District. So back in the early seventies, um, a big, a, a big construction group, uh, the uh, Woodmore Corporation, was developing this area. Uh, I guess let's back up a little bit. Um, Back in, in the 70s, the, uh, Colorado was going to be a host of the uh, Olympic, uh, Olympic, uh, Winter Olympic Games. And with that, you know, uh, this consortium of builders were trying to create villas or, you know, like, like um, uh, Olympic uh, villages, Olympic like, towns, right? Right. For people to come in and, and have, mm -hmm. like, to accommodate the mass inflow of people that are uh, uh, extraordinary. Correct. Correct. So, um, so again, this is just historical that I've been told through uh, my previous okay. general managers and uh, my attorney who's been there with the district for, for 45 years. Um, anyway, so they, they created, they were creating these, these, these winter villages, these paradise winter villages you know, with a ski resort and, you know, like Nordic training centers and whatnot. So the Woodmore Corporation bought all these, these 11,000 acres of mountain, uh, you know, like pristine Colorado mountain. Um, and uh, they began, began to develop uh, a, a small village, you know, a winter that would hold Olympic athletes and, you know, that would bring a lot of revenue to the district and, so on the district ended up going i mean the the developer ended up defaulting and uh, i think because they 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 the olympics were not coming to colorado anymore so obviously they they defaulted and they were ne they were never able to finish the project they have subdivided this 11,000 acres you know to include the open space and everything but there was 2200 lots that were created for as part of this entire project, only 400, 500 of those were actually connected to some sort of water and sewer. Um, it's like a, a fifth. <laughs> yes, yes. So one fifth of them were connected to some sort of infrastructure, and everything else was roads were not put in. Uh, of, of course, no water and sewer at all. Um, and uh, so they were, you know, they, they defaulted and the county was like, well, we don't have the power or the money or nor we want to take over, a, a, you know, a whole new spectrum of work where like the county and, the, you know, development kind of pays its way. So um, Stagecoach went dormant into, you know, and, and Stagecoach 
is the the, the, the larger area that the Morrison Creek water sanitation serves that area. So the stagecoach went dormant. And it just kind of lay low there. You know, they came out of bankruptcy actually in 2003. Um, and, uh, and it just sat dormant. Um, and he basically served uh, the, the city of Steamboat Springs as their somewhat affordable housing area or the commuter area for, although there was only 400 homes at that time. Uh, but most people, uh, probably 90% of the people that lived there um, were commuting into Steamboat um, for work. So that's how the, the Morrison Creek Water and Sanitation was created to serve this. Uh, it was an villa. Olympic village that con got converted to a affordable housing, which mm -hmm. then started to become a more attractive area over time as people started to discover, well, hey, mm -hmm. the Stagecoach Reservoir area, is, this is a pretty cool spot to live. Absolutely. So... Uh, in that hired on the district in 2019, I, I'm sorry, 2020, uh, in October 2020, and um, COVID happened. Um, well, COVID had happened before a, a little bit, you know, the, the year prior, right. and um, but. Uh, in 2020, we started seeing just a massive influx of people from everywhere. Um, our, constru our construction, you know, sometimes the district, I mean, based on historical data that I've seen, the district was uh, sometimes had negative growth. <laughs> you know, like people <laughs> would move out. There was zero growth Um and sometimes, you know, like I said, you know, some people would just leave and, you know, houses would be empty. Um, so, but anyway, so in 2020, you know, COVID showed people that telework was possible. And, you know, all of a sudden we started seeing these massive influx of people, 500% increase on an, of the average. We saw 500% increase of the average in 2020 and 300% of that in 2021. It Holy was crap. crazy. <laughs> we started seeing this crazy influx of all kinds of people and, you know, a lot of uh, second home um, and a lot of people who now telework, uh, which, you know, now that, that, you know, you can, you could, people that were working in the, uh, you know, Silicon Valley in California or in Texas, <laughs> Now they were coming to work in a town with nobody. We, you know, we had 700 people. Wow. So um, that's incredible. So people start discovering this secret paradise that's kind of like hidden away out there. The, when, the, when, when the developer went bankrupt, you had mentioned to me at one point that you called this a temporary wastewater treatment plant. Is that how this like was it permitted originally as temporary then he went bankrupt and then it kind of just floated down the road so yes so um the the wit that was uh built in the 70s uh was built as a temporary plant um later was permitted as a you know just regular wastewater treatment plant but um yeah, I mean, the idea was that once the, the, you know, they got the first 500 homes connected to, to infrastructure, and as they grew, there was supposed to be another wastewater treatment plant that would serve the upper section of this, this system, with, you know, a, another 1,500 lots or another 1,500. Yeah, yeah I'm going to say lots because a lot of those lots were multifamily. So... You know, I would guess probably serve another couple thousand units, living units. Um, so there was uh, plans for another wastewater treatment plant. Um, so the, the, the plant that we are currently operating has <laughs> been working since 1973. And it was supposed to be a temporary wastewater treatment plant. 
But after the, the Wilmer Corporation went bankrupt and defaulted in the construction of the district, there was just nothing else the district could do but to continue to operate this plant and just extend the life of it as much as possible. Um, and with that, you know, created really good operators because, uh, you know, as the, as the plant continues to age, um, you know, we, we still have the same requirements uh, on cleanliness and quality of the effluent. Right. So therefore, when, when I started, there, there was a huge rush to, to try to get this project going. Uh, which, you know, eventually after a uh, couple of years of planning and a couple of years trying to get financing, uh, we were able to, to get started. What kind of uh, challenges did you have in your new treatment plant that um, were kind of difficult to deal with? That, like, was the F, meeting effluent qualities hard, uh, uh, requirements hard or the location or any of those things that you have to fight with the CDPHE on? Yes. So, the of course the federal and state uh, regulations, and you know they have quality uh, water quality limits uh, on our on the effluent uh, that we have to meet, and and there is all kinds of rules and all kinds of um, you know ideologies, and the state has the rules and you know limits and. Uh, I mean, just a lot of different things that we had to comply with, um, which it makes sense. It, it absolutely makes sense. You know, we want to make sure that our discharge is as clean as possible into a reservoir that is utilized for recreation. You know, they actually have a swim swim beach at the reservoir. Uh, so we want to make sure that the effluent <laughs> is of the yeah. high, highest quality well, I think possible. you regularly find people uh, ice fishing there. I've driven by and seen seen it frozen yes. over yeah fishing is actually one of the the most important activities at that reservoir we they had a lot of big trout we have a lot of lo native trout and a lot of uh, invasive species like the pike the northern pike which they actually hold a tournament in the reservoir trying to see who can catch the largest pike because it is an invasive species so they actually try to get them all out but ah, it is a, okay. a fish that could get up to like 50 inches long so it's it's a pretty pretty big fish, and they oh, wow. tend and they tend to eat the uh, the native species. So it is encouraged for people to try to fish pike, and and try to you know get them out of the lake as much as possible. So yes, but to your point, there is a lot of uh, recreational activity in that reservoir. So so a lot um, of people were interested, like the CAPHE, and and how. They wanted to have a say in what happened with this new plant. Correct. Yeah. So, so permitting was a challenge. <laughs> uh, we had, you know, all kinds of permitting challenges to go through with the CDP, CDPHE, the Colorado Department of Health, uh, Colorado Department of Health and Environment. So we had challenge a really challenging time um, trying to get the, the new wastewater treatment plant permitted. Uh, which I thought it was silly because we have the same goal. We had this, you know, we 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 want to make sure that we produce this the best quality effluent. As my children recreate in that uh, that reservoir, you know, I want to make sure that that effluent is of the best quality. And and I think we all have the same goal. But for some reason, you know, going through permitting uh, permitting is issues, you know, it gets really challenging, really tough. But we were able to work through the challenges, uh, jump those hurdles, and and we were able to get the, the wastewater treatment plant permitted and, uh, and now under construction. What kind of strategies, like specifically the hurdles you had to go through, did you have any sort of, um, if I can remember, you mentioned uh, like a mixing requirement or uh, did you have to get a, a doctorate involved to write a, a study or <laughs> anything like that? We did. We did. So we had actually had to have three different uh, studies done that, you know, b because we discharged into, we would not have to do this if we discharged into a river. But because uh, we discharged into a lake, you know, we had these extra requirements that, to go through. 
So one of those requirements, you know, was an archaeological, I'm sorry, geological, archaeological uh, requirements. And also we had to perform this mixing zone studies that was, you know, had to, we had to bring somebody, uh, uh, you know, a PhD uh, to, to do the work and, uh, you know, identify how mixing of the effluent uh, behaves um, under different seasons. Um, on, wow. on the reservoir. So we had to perform three different mixing zone studies, one in the summer, one in the fall, and one in the winter when the, when the, uh, uh, the, 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 the water moves less, right? Because it's a cover under a foot of ice. So, but we were able to demonstrate, you know, that the, the, there was plenty of, uh, of mixing. Um, you know, again, going talking about challenges, the, the state required us, wanted us to do one more uh, study in the spring, which we, we, I mean, we might actually do it, but, you know, in the springtime, there's a lot more water, a lot more flow. So that would indicate that, you know, it mixes more. And also, you know, they, as, they, as the water comes in, you know, it starts to mix more. So obviously there's going to be more mixing, but, you know, you would only hope that the state tells us, yes, we understand that, and you don't have to do it, but we haven't had that luck yet. Um, okay. That's awesome. So you got over that hurdle, and then the next one, I think we kind of started talking about it, was the funding. You've got this bankrupted, or previously bankrupted district. I, I hear the story a lot is mm -hmm. they're kind of, they're operating at, uh, man, it's just duct tape. The whole thing is duct taped together. Um, which is pretty similar to what you came into. So <laughs> what what did you have to do to get this new plant uh, paid for? Well, I want to say I had to do everything. I, I mean, I, I didn't know much of how to do it. So I just had to start poking every hole that I could find and reading, you know, like, okay, how do we get financing from, from the state? You know, and, and I just started going to different meetings and talking to different people, different general managers or different, you know, just, just, we just pick up the, the phone and make phone calls to larger uh, uh, facilities in larger metro districts and uh, water and sanitation districts. And it, I just uh, outright just tell them, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. How have you guys done it? Can you help me? And just talking to a lot of different people, you know, we started you know, talking to CDPHE and to the state and uh, the Department of Local Affairs and DOLA. And, uh, you know, I, I went out to my county commissioners and I told them, hey, I'm trying to do this. I need some money. And I would just ask for money. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I figured the worst thing they could do is say no. And uh, I just started asking around. And, you know, with that, Again, that was a whole new perspective of knowledge that I, I was gaining uh, and how to, you know, I, I wouldn't say I became an expert, but I definitely learned a ton during that process uh, of, of nothing related to engineering or, or to do the work that I was trying to do the work, but it was just completely different side, just finding money, mm, you know, because we need money right. to do any, any kind of work. <laughs> Um, so with that, you know, I came across the USDA funding and, uh, CDPHE funding, um, uh, you know, funding through uh, the state through DOLA. Uh, and I actually applied for every grant, um, with the help of uh, Adam at Aquaworks. Uh, you know, we applied for every grant that we could find and we were able to, to, to get it done. And we, we got financing and, and we were able to pay for all of the engineering on grants. And, uh, you know, the, the USDA, you know, have, you know, came across some money through the bipartisan, um, bill, um, for, for, you know, to renew all the aging infrastructure. And we were able to obtain a grant combined with a loan from the USDA that, you know, ended up financing the entire project. So essentially you're getting like 50 cents on the dollar 
lumped into some sort of low interest loan kind of thing. Okay. All right. So really, so really the, the lesson learned there is, um, and you know, I had David on, um, at round mountain and he said the same thing. He said, I just started asking everybody because eventually we hit a level of desperation and we're just like, I, I just have, I have to let everyone know I need help. Like, can you help me No, can, Like, and you just have to keep turning rocks over. Absolutely. I think that was, that was it until I came across, um, I think it was the Crested Butte Water Sanitation District. And, uh, and they gave me some insight that, you know, like, because th- th- there was a, a lot of different uh, um, aspects. I mean, just trying to get this financing was so cumbersome because it was a puzzle. You know, we, the district, um, you know, to, to, to be able to get, obtain debt, the district had to go under a vote, you know. It had, you know, because of the table laws, we had to go and out for a vote. But we knew that we were going to fail at that, you know, because of the because no the one history. wants to pay more. <laughs> exactly, and because of the history of the district, you know, we have five hundred homes that are connected to the system, but we have uh, seventeen hundred lots that are not connected to the system. So. The great, the, the, the vast ma- majority of people are getting no services from the district, uh, although they do in, indirectly, uh, but 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 uh, but not they're not receiving any services from the district directly. Um, and uh, anyway, so we knew that we were going to fail uh, if we tried to go for a vote. We were going to spend a lot of money and a lot of time, you know, one year plus on something that we were going to fail and and we already knew that the district had tried that already a couple times every time they failed and and i see i saw that not being different this time and so you know somebody told me like well you can turn this district into an enterprise and you know as long as you're not using property taxes and like tabor money you can finance this as an enterprise and just pay pay this loan with user fees and i was like okay please please tell me more about this tell me more about this tell me more i'm trying to yeah so we were able to convert our our district and the water and sewer uh portion they act as their own entities that they you know they finance every project uh, through a, a an enterprise so so they they pay for everything from their user fees and not not money from property tax so that allows that enterprise to receive loans grants um as its own individual entity um and we didn't have to deal with the vote so but that implied that we had to go and break down the entire district that how it was formed, and, and break it down into pieces, right? So, for, so each water is their own entity, sewer is their own entity, um, you know. And if we ever went to uh, you know the, the parks or anything like that, it would have to be our, their own. So, so that that is the only way that we could get finance without having to go for out for a popular vote, which we knew it was going to fail. So we did, we had to work through all that through a year planning and we finally were able to pull it off and we did it. Wow. And it just took a year. So was it a year once you figured out the way to go, like what the whole time just to get it funded or are we talking like two or three years? Well, I think uh, at least two years. I mean, the, the, the one year was just, once we knew what we had to do, then it took about a year. Oh, right? wow. Okay. So, but yeah, the whole process, the planning process was obviously a couple of years. Gotcha. So was the, the plant that you were able to design, is it designed just for the existing, uh, existing 400 homes? Did you guys plan it, do some master planning ahead of that for all 1,400 lots, which I think you said was thousands of units or users? 
Yeah. So, so yes, no, we, we definitely gave us some room. Um, and it's, it's not so much the, how big the plant is or how much it is able to, to treat. It's most we're regulated by the amount that we are allowed to discharge. Uh, that's really the limiting factor. And uh, right now we're operating at about 25% capacity. So we have some room to grow. Uh, to grow. And, uh, you know, with that being said, you know, we have, uh, like, I, like I said before, stagecoach was discovered. So now we not only have homes being built, we have large proposals for development. So in the last year, we have received two proposals that would bring another 1,000 homes to the district. Wow. That's additional to the already existing 1,700 lots that are not developed. So at that point, we may have to think, you know, the board may have to assess maybe we need another wastewater treatment plant or, or so on, something along those lines. Holy crap. So yeah, yeah. that's pretty massive. What is it is would it would your your current plant would it treat that? Or are you saying it's in a different location and you guys would have to build a plant to serve that community? Um so if those new subdivisions or these two proposed developments were to happen now or the next five years, we would have the, I think we would have the capacity to, to serve, but that is disregarding the other 1700 lots that are not connected. And, you know, those 1700 lots that are not connected, they've been paying property tax and district fees and district, uh, 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 taxes for the last 50 years. So, uh, you know, it, it'll be really tough uh, right. on the board uh, to decide whether they allow this new growth uh, that, that has not been paying into those 50 years in, for the last 50 years. Um, because what if those other 1,700 lots, we at some point extend water and sewer lines to them Will they be in the right. hook for no, that, building a new a, wastewater treatment plant? Right. That's a really interesting point. So just to, just so I can reiterate or summarize your point, you're saying you had all those lots that were originally formed with the district. They've been pay, they've been paying for their seat for for fifty years, um, or someone has whoever owned that property. And the new guy comes in and he's going to subdivide it all out and, or whatever, you know, put an apartment complex or whatever, however that's uh, planned. And they haven't been paying the into the district. And so, yeah, I guess you're trying to figure out how do you what's fair? Like, how do you even calculate what's fair? Exactly. Yeah. So, oh, man, you know, they may take the entire capacity. But then, you know, we got to think, okay, who's going to be, um, you know, on the hook for building the next wastewater treatment plant if we exceed the capacity? So that's something that, you know, the, the board and myself, of course, we have to, to, to probably engage with the developers and say, you know, and come to some sort of agreement um, as far as wastewater treatment goes. Yeah, I mean typically that's really interesting because I'm guessing your standard tap fee for those people who are already in the district does not apply to new district D's or however that, whatever that word is. Um, I guess, you know, because we don't have infrastructure that could serve that development, that type of development, uh, they're going to have to bring all the infrastructure, but uh, uh, you know, tap fees, you know, again, we have to address how are we going to charge them for tap fees? Um, you know, I, I've been in meetings uh, with a lot of districts um, in towns and cities, and I've been trying to learn from them how do they approach these large developments. You know, like I've talked a lot to the city of Steamboat Springs because they have large developments uh, that come up and they use their, their facilities uh, and their utilities 
Um, but as also, for me, it is important to talk to developers who, who have gone through dealing with towns and cities and whatnot to try to understand the developer perspective. And how do right, they so see? That, yeah, how do, how are they making it? How are they putting their puzzle pieces together? Correct. So it is really interesting to learn from them. And thankfully, I have a, a few really good and large developers that I, you know, came across my path. Uh, and I have had the, 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 I've been so lucky to be able to, you know, steal a couple of hours from them and just kind of pick their brain and see what, how they have approached towns and cities. Because uh, I want to be fair. I want to be fair uh, to all of our customers and uh, the citizens that currently live in the district and that will live in the district in the future. Wow, so that's, really, that's a really interesting story. So there's not really a school of district managers or there's not a like fundamental overarching rules that apply to this mm-hmm. and it, it's kind of situationally based uh, just and I'm, I'm, i don't want to rant on too much but it's kind of like you had to go and lean on all these other people's uh opinions and the history of what's happened to them uh to help drive your decision absolutely uh yeah i think the best way to gain knowledge is just don't be afraid to to talk to the people who've done it. Uh, zero pride here. <laughs> you know, I got no pride. I just have to go and ask. Uh, I think just relying on, on people's history and experience is so valuable. So valuable. Um, on just they, they, People have had to go through, through different things and different scenarios to, to, to achieve what they've done. Um, so yes, I, I think that that was probably the, the, the most, more, you know, my, my, I would say my quality is just that I, I'm not afraid to go ask and, 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 and network. So you would, would you show up to their, just their town meetings or district meetings and stuff and just start asking questions? I'm just kind of curious, how do you get connected with them for, for other district managers out there? They're trying to figure out how to solve their problem. Yeah, you know, I would always, uh, you know, I, I would kind of compare my my district to a uh, like districts, you know, like so s- small communities in the mountains. Um, you know, in, in my district is a little bit weird because, again, it used to be a, it was created to be this really beautiful kind of wealthier, you know, Olympic uh, area that produced a lot of income. And brought jobs, but ended up being nothing, and it was neglected and forgotten about. But it's still within this kind of wealthy area, you know, like Northern Rao County is, is pretty wealthy, I would say. Um, so they, they, there is a lot of money um, around. But then there was this little valley that was kind of untouched, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, once COVID hit, and then housing started blooming you know, the, the prices skyrocketed again. So here I am into this district where people are building million dollar, you know, several million dollar homes with very little infrastructure under the ground. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's been challenging, but at the same time, really exciting because I feel like now that with all this growth, we have the capacity to start thinking about the future in shaping our future. How do we want this to be? How do I want this to look in the next 20 to 50 years? It's now. I, the actions that the district, myself and the board and, and everybody that works for us, and the county, of course, county planning, the, the actions that we take today, it's what the district is going to look like in the future. So uh, we got to make sure that we we shape it the right way. So, yeah, I think that was something real neat. When I came into your office, you showed me like, oh, look at this. Wouldn't this be a beautiful park? And this is a, this is where the elk go through. And 
what kind of things are the county and the district kind of collaborating on to help preserve some of that rural nature, you know, that just, what makes it unique? What? Um... So we are blessed to be in an area that is still pristine. Uh, we have lots of, of elk. Uh, we have some of the largest elk herds in Colorado. Uh, we have a lot of mountain lion, a lot of bear. I mean, the wildlife is just plentiful in our area. We have great fishing, a lot of native trout, native uh, fishery. Um, so when we think about growth, we cannot exempt the wildlife from our growth. I think we have to be respectful to it. Um, they've been there before we were. Um, and when planning for growth, I, I, I think that we should be really cognizant of who also uses that space and that being wildlife. Um, and, and when I say we get to shape the district the way we want it to be, and I'm an out, outdoorsman person, I, I would like for the wildlife to be able to still stick around even though, you know, I understand that we're going to disturb some of that, but we can do growth, responsible growth. So what would that look like in terms of like a typical density uh, per acre? Because I think people in the city, they think, oh, well, a 0.1 acre lot is totally normal thing. I'm guessing in, out, out in your district and a lot of Route County, a 0.1 acre lot would be only something maybe you find in Steamboat. Um, what, would, what does that look like? So um, we're in our, we have several uh, large, larger parcels that are designed to be multifamily, uh, um, high density parcels. And we want to make sure that we concentrate the density within those parcels. Um, I would say everything else ranges from one to five acres. Um, um, just to come up with an average, I would say, you know, an acre is probably the, the, an average size lot. But there are, uh, you know, because of the, the way the district has been shaped, uh, five acre lots are also pretty common. Okay. Wow. And yeah, I just think it's so neat to, to think of this big planning and meanwhile you can have elk just going through your backyard. I mm -hmm. like, I, 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 I live in the city. I'm a city person. But when I spend those couple days out in rural Colorado, it feels like a magical thing. I don't know how to say it. Like the, the not being close to so many people and having a bear walk across your backyard. It, it's a pretty unreal feeling. It is. I think that, it just brings you, uh, I think it just brings you closer to our, you know, more, most human being part of us. Uh, and, you know, just where, you know, we remind ourselves where we, where we came from and, you know, like what, how our lives were in the past. And when we didn't have, you know, transportation or, or internet <laughs> uh, and it, it just being out with a lot of, timber and a lot of wildlife is it, it just it, it, there is some sort of peace that i personally feel um and and again it, when i think of growth you know i want to be able to shape that growth in a way that we continue to feel that uh that that mountain air and and um you know and still sur be surrounded by by wildlife love it i love it what um, if someone wanted to reach out to you um, so that they can learn the many lessons you've learned from meeting and running down all these rabbit holes on your own? What what would be a great way for them to reach out to you? Uh, you know, our website, mcwater, www.mcwater.org. All my contact is on the website. Uh, I am always so happy to hear from somebody from a different district. 
Um, I am always open for any questions, whatever I can help with. Uh, I'm always glad to help because I, that's the way I learned. That's the way I, I was able to get things done is asking people. And thankfully, a lot of district managers or engineers, state engineers, district engineers, city engineers, they have all have taken the time to, to show me the ropes. Uh, actually, uh, just a couple of weeks back, I reached out to the Eagle River Water Sanitation District to learn from their employee housing programs. Because in, in Colorado, in the mountain towns, are having a, a, a huge, huge problem with employee housing because of the cost of living. There's just not enough housing for, for people to work for the, the, the water and sewer district, for the fire district, or school districts even. There's just no housing or affordable housing, let's say. Um, so I, I reached out to learn from them how they're approaching this, this big problem that we have in Colorado. Um, and, you know, I learned a ton, and I'm going to start implementing some stuff in my district, you know, creating those, those capital reserves and, you know, kind of shaping our budget to, to be able to plan for these, uh, uh, th those issues that are coming. They're coming. They're, we're, we're no different from some other larger towns. It's coming to us. Wow. So the... That's so interesting. So you're you're the the lesson learned is once you kind of like getting over the curve, you've kind of dug your way out of this pit. And now you're thinking like I'm, we're going to the moon, and how can we do that? And how can we shape our trajectory with our focus and planning? I think that you hit that right on the spot. I think <laughs> we're barely. I okay. wouldn't say we're out of the hole yet, but we're we're crawling slowly out of the hole and. Without looking at the moon, you know, our vision has always had to be within, you know, our vision should be five, 10 and 50 years um, uh, when, when we're planning for, uh, you know, water, sewer infrastructure, road infrastructure, um, school infrastructure. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's just, I'm crawling out of this hole where we were and, you know, our first big project is going to get done. And then, you know, the, the, to, we have a lot more work to, to do. Father. Well, Giovanni, I really appreciate you coming onto the show today and sharing your vast, immense, cha immense challenges that you've gone through. Um, I think a lot of people will be able to lean on this information and, and use it to help educate themselves. Yeah, no, I think that's the only way. It's networking with the people that are, that are alike. All right. Awesome. Well, that's it for the show today. Um, once again, Gio, Giovanni, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.